the human mate for the Dragon Prince. Dragon Kings of Fire and Ice, Book 6. By Amelia Shaw. Narrated by Catherine Bilson. Chapter 1. Anselm. Even after nearly thirty years of marriage, my parents were still sickeningly in love. My sister Vanya rolled her eyes at me from across the dining table, then spoke to our parents. Mom, seriously? You're going to make me lose my breakfast over here. I wasn't sure why Vanya was only blaming our mother, but she had to choose someone to lay the blame on. About ten minutes ago, Dad had pulled Mom into his lap where he sat at the head of the table. Mom had her arms wrapped around his neck, and they were kissing and caressing each other, like a couple of teenagers on heat. Mom sighed loudly and managed to climb out of her husband's arms and stand up. Then she straightened her long-sleeved royal purple dress and glared at my sister. When you find your mate one day, young lady, you'll know what it's like, then hopefully you'll stop pestering us. Dad laughed. Then it'll be our turn to gripe at you. Yeah, promises, promises my unmarried sister grumped. Speaking of mates. Hey, Dad, can I have a chat with you after breakfast about something? My father, King Stavrog, was still a strong, large man. He'd kept the people in our kingdom fed and safe for the entirety of his reign. But to me, he was Dad. The most loyal family man I'd ever known. Dad looked up at me, his eyebrows slightly raised. He knew what I was asking for. A conversation away from the females in our family. Yes, of course, son. He agreed with a regal nod, then his characteristic grin. We finished breakfast, and my sister Vanya left the dining room alongside our mother. They were chatting about going to visit our other sister, Jessa. She lived at Uncle Eric and Aunt Marianne's castle in the Black Mountains. Jessa had married their oldest son, and the couple stayed there most of the time. Jessa enjoyed the company of her mother-in-law, Marianne, and the Queen's penchant to predict the future and cast spells. It also made sense to learn the way of their kingdom, as Jessa would one day be their queen, as I would one day be the leader of our kingdom. A daunting prospect, and a hard act to follow, for both of us. Come, Anselm, sit. Dad gestured to the chair opposite his. He'd moved away from the dining room table and closer to the fireplace, the castle warm considering it was snowing outside. I sat where my father dictated and waited for him to begin the conversation. He chuckled, the sound rough yet joyous. My childhood had been filled with that sound, and to this day it still made me smile. You wanted to chat, son. What's on your mind? Hit me. I opened my mouth to begin the speech I'd rehearsed a hundred times, then words failed me. I slammed my mouth shut again, self-annoyance making my jaw clench. Dad laughed again. Would you like me to guess? No, it's just, I haven't said this out loud before, and I'm afraid how it's going to sound. The idea of appearing weak or cowardly in front of my father was one of my greatest fears. King Stavrok was a legend, a warrior, a man who'd saved the North and defended the South, a king who loved his people and whose people loved him back. He wasn't just a hard act to follow. He was impossible. Dad sighed and settled deeper into the cushions of his armchair. I don't want you to ever be worried about speaking to me. I love you, no matter what. My parents' ability to embarrass me out of nowhere always surprised me. Not that I was ungrateful for their unconditional support and love. My siblings and I were lucky, and we knew it. But Dad always managed to hit me with a comment like that, out of the blue. Always. I was almost thirty years old, and yet I felt as small as I did when I was five years old, still seeking my father's approval. Thanks, Dad. I managed to get out. I love you too. It's just that... What? I was lonely, on a level I couldn't even express. 
even though I was always surrounded, the gnawing feeling never went away. Even with thousands of people in the village and hundreds of servants within the castle. Even with parents who were overly affectionate and often stifling in their love for me. Even with sisters that I was closer to than anyone else on the planet, I was lonely. I need my mate. There. I'd said it. Dad's eyebrows flicked up as though my answer had surprised him. Then he nodded. Yes, I remember that feeling too well. Sucked balls. And not in the good way. I practically choked on my tongue hearing the expression exit my father's mouth, then coughed to try and clear my throat again. Once again, my dad had shocked me. Uh, yeah, it does. Dad nodded, turning his head to stare off into the fireplace. I was thirty-five when I met your mother. I was going insane with my need for a mate. It didn't matter who crawled into my bed or how much I ignored the feeling, the anger, the unrest. It grew and grew until there was nothing else that mattered. I wasn't sure I'd gotten that bad yet, but my future wasn't looking pretty. The depression was beginning to win, and I wasn't sure I had the strength to push it away any longer. I sat a little straighter, getting to the point of this chat faster than I'd expected to. I know you credit Aunt Marianne with you finding Mum in the human realm, but do you think it's possible for me to just cross the veil and find her? The human world was a thousand times bigger than our hidden realm. My father, a dragon king, had been given a mental map to find his fated mate, Lucy, a human and my mother. I wasn't sure I was going to be as lucky. You know, your mom and Vanya are flying over to visit Jessa this afternoon. Why don't we all go? If we were going to visit Jessa, then we were going to the Black Mountains. To Marianne and Eric's kingdom. They should all be there, and I'd have the chance to ask the sorceress myself. I slid forward on my seat. You think Aunt Marianne would help me? Dad shrugged his massive shoulders. It can't hurt to ask. I sighed, feeling the weight of disappointment already pressing down on me. You don't think she'll be able to see anything, do you? Dad stood up and I followed suit, jumping to my feet. He clapped me on the shoulder, the way he did when he was trying to encourage me to go forward with something. Marianne isn't a crystal ball, son. She doesn't have a lot of control over her visions, or so she says. You can't just rub her head and get an answer. But you can certainly ask and hope that she sees something that will help you. Hope soared in my heart for the first time in too long. Thank you, father. Dad walked toward the door. I stepped in alongside him. I'll let your mother know that we'll all go for the visit today. So go and pack, and I'll send a message to Eric as well. His castle is about to become considerably fuller. I chuckled and ran off to pack for a few days away. If Dad had his way, we'd all fly in our dragon form, and he'd carry Mother to the Black Mountains. Our luggage would go via horse and carriage and arrive this evening. Within the hour, we were all packed, the carriage was on its way, and we were all standing on the balcony atop the North Tower. You know, this is where your father landed when he brought me home that first time, Mom said, sighing with remembrance. Vanya rolled her eyes. He kidnapped you, Mom. No point sugarcoating it. Mom laughed, her body shaking with the motion. Oh, don't worry. I've never forgotten that part of the story. I know it's not modern or very feminist, but damn, I loved the fact that your father couldn't control his dragon around me, and he had no choice but to take me away. Vanya put her hand on her hip and glared at her. What did I say about sugarcoating things? Mom grinned, her blue eyes lighting up with joy. Okay, I was pretty pissed off to begin with. But there's nothing like being the sole focus of a man like your father. You'll see. One day. Vanya groaned and stepped up to the ledge. I'm out. See you all there. My sister threw off her fur robe, revealing her naked form. Then she jumped, launching herself into the air and shifting as she went. 
Her wings extended out as she swooped low over the kingdom, then flew high in the direction of the Black Mountains. My father chuckled and stepped closer to my mother. I'll shift, then you climb on my back. She nodded and walked over to me, giving my father room to shift into his dragon so he could carry her for the trip. Our mother was human, so I was grateful, as were all my siblings, that we had inherited our father's shifting abilities. We could all shift and fly, just as strongly as any full-blooded dragon we knew. Despite my mixed blood, our people loved our mother and had accepted me as the heir to the throne. I stared at her for a moment, taking in the look of love on her face as she watched my father ready to shift. It was impossible to miss the devotion in either of them. Mom? Yes, sweetheart. Her eyes were firmly glued to my father, who was now stripping his robe off to shift for flight. Is that true? She turned toward me now, her eyebrows narrowed in confusion. Is what true, Anselm? I swallowed hard, forcing myself past the natural resistance to asking these sorts of questions. That you were glad father stole you from everything you've ever known. That you were flattered in a way. Mom gripped my hand hard. Son, at first I was fucking furious. There's no sugarcoating that. But as I fell madly deeply in love with him and met some of his past lovers, she growled as she shuddered. I realized that his dragon grabbing me in such a way was the one thing I could hold on to, that no one else had. He wanted me and literally fought to the death to save me. My shock was very real when I gaped at her. He what? She smiled softly. I think it's time that we tell you the full story and there's no better place than the room where it happened. See you at Eric's castle. I nodded and watched in awe as my mother pulled up her fur hood and tugged on her gloves. It was freezing for a human to travel in our weather, something I needed to remember if I ever had to transport my own woman. Mom climbed onto my father's back and clung tight as he gently stretched out his wings and flew up into the air above the castle. No tricks or swoops like my sister. My mother wouldn't have enjoyed that. I stood on the balcony watching their figures get smaller as they moved off into the distance. There was one thing that niggled at me, like a voice in the back of your mind that just wouldn't shut up. My mate wasn't living in our realm as a dragon shifter. She was human. I knew it as a truth. I didn't know how, but I felt it. I was half human after all, so it made sense in some strange way. I stepped up onto the ledge and looked down upon my father's kingdom. The township, lands and wealth would be mine one day. The mantle of responsibility sat heavily on my shoulders, though my father carried most of the weight. He was great and mighty, but one day he wouldn't be here, and I needed a strong queen at my side to move into the future proudly. My grandparents were fated mates. My parents' love was an epic story of devotion. I would not fail to live up to the same expectations of my life. In all aspects. I threw off my fur coat and let the cold wind chill my skin. I took a large breath in through my nose, enjoying the discomfort. My dragon surged inside me, wanting out. Needing to fly. I let go of my humanity and my shifter soared through me. My bones extended, and my skin changed the hardened, protective scales of my dragon. My wings unfurled from my back, and our connection strengthened. They were each an extra limb, an important one. I jumped from the balcony, not flying straight away. Instead I fell, letting the adrenaline pump through my blood as I hurtled toward the stones at the base of the castle. My wings wrapped around my body while I plummeted, then at the last moment I threw my wings open and soared up, across the rooftops of the village and over the homes of the people. My father's people. My people. A few of them waved, while others shook their heads at my well-known antics. When I reached the edge of our town I flapped my wings harder to gain height, taking to the skies where the air was thin and the clouds were thick. 
It was time to talk to the sorceress and see if she could help me find the future I hoped was waiting for me. Chapter 2 Anselm The flight to the Black Mountains was beautiful. It was spring, so despite the cold and scattered snow on the ground below me, many flowers were already in bloom and the lands were unusually green. I landed on the highest balcony of the castle, noting a servant standing by with a dark cloak. I let go of my dragon, shrinking back to my human form and shivering the moment my skin was touched by a dusting of falling snow. Your Highness, the servant called out, scurrying over to offer me the cloak. I am Thomas and am here to serve you. I smiled and took the wrapping from him, grateful for its warmth when I threw it over my shoulders. Thank you, Thomas. Have the rest of my family arrived? Thomas nodded and walked beside me over to the large glass door. Yes, they're all dressing in their quarters. Allow me to show you to your rooms. We walked inside and closed the thick door behind us. I shivered at the extreme temperature difference. It was warm in the halls as we moved along the hallway and my body began to thaw. Your room, sire, Thomas said, as we stopped outside a bedroom in the guest quarters. The servant was an older man and would stand on tradition, I was sure. Even so, I couldn't help but tease him a little. Thomas, are you sure this is a guest suite? Knowing my sister, she probably told you to throw me in some sort of closet. As I expected, Thomas's face turned to horror. Oh no, sire! This room is... I laughed and clapped the man on the shoulder. It's all good, Thomas. I was only joking. My twin sister may wish to stick me in the dungeon, but I'm sure the Queen wouldn't allow it. Vanya, Jessa and I were unidentical triplets. But it was easier to say twin sister because triplet sister just didn't roll off the tongue in the same way. Thomas's lips quirked for the first time. The princess is a lively one. I burst out laughing. Yes, she is. She must keep your prince on his toes. Though Marianne and Eric's first-born son, Karlak, was quite the taskmaster himself. I'd grown up spending a lot of time with him, we all had. It wasn't until Jessa turned twenty-one did Karlak make his move on our sister. Two years younger than her, Karlak fought off several suitors to win my sister's hand. They were a great match. Thomas inclined his head, snapping back into a serious tone. Our prince is very happy. I chuckled again. I can imagine he is. Now, where do I find some clothes to wear, and which meeting area are we all meant to be at? Thomas showed me where some of Prince Carlac's clothes had been laid out for me inside the bedroom I'd been assigned, then he instructed me to meet the rest of the families in the larger of the dining halls. The larger one? I asked, surprised. There were less than ten of us, unless my information wasn't correct. Thomas simply nodded and excused himself. Doesn't matter, I guess, I said, still puzzling over why we'd need so much space. That dining table could easily seat fifty people. I dressed quickly and headed down to the dining hall. I'd be the last one there, I was sure. Whenever I flew here, I took my time, enjoying the freedom of flying in my dragon form. When I stepped up to the entryway and a servant opened the door for me, my assumption proved correct. Late as always, Jessa declared, waddling toward me. I hadn't seen my sister in a month, and I was surprised to see how big her belly had grown in that time. You look ready to pop, sister dearest, I said, reaching out to rub her belly before putting my arm around her for a hug. She laughed and shoved at me. I wish I was. Unfortunately, our doctor thinks there's more than one of these monsters inside of me. I grinned at her. I'm not surprised. You always were the most like mother. Mother had given birth to us triplets, then our younger brother, Ian. Surely a multiple birth for Jessa and Vanya was in the cards. Jessa heaved a huge sigh. Yeah, yeah. Jessa and Karlak had been married over seven years. It had shocked everyone that they'd waited so long to birth the next generation, 
but I had the feeling she'd felt guilty leaving Vanya and I so far behind. I dropped a kiss on her cheek. I'm really happy for you, sis. You deserve the world. She met my gaze, and for the first time in a long time, I saw the glimmer of unshed tears in her blue eyes. She launched at me with her arms open wide, almost knocking me over in her fervor. Whoa, I laughed, gripping her so we both didn't topple over. I want the same happiness for you. She whispered the words in my ear, holding me tight. I sighed and hugged her tighter, my heart aching at the love I felt for her. One day. We pulled apart and that's when I realized the party was larger than just the two royal families. Auntie Cass, I didn't realize you were here. I walked forward to greet the large party standing next to the huge dining table, laden with morning tea. Fruits and cheeses, drinks and breads. I hugged my father's cousin and our hosts. Hello, Aunt Marianne, I said, giving her a squeeze before moving on to shake hands with Uncle Eric and Cass's two sons, Theo and Bernie. Where's Uncle Damon? I asked, looking toward Cass. Cass rolled her eyes. You know Damon. He doesn't like to leave the castle, and I felt like a break from the freezing temperatures. Theo laughed. Dad's dealing with a failed crop and more building. Our population has boomed the last few years, and we don't have enough housing for everyone. If you need help, I'm available, I offered, feeling the need to get my hands dirty again. I'd spent many months at the Winter Kingdom through the years, and the work there was hard, but very satisfying. Leo turned to me with a grin. We could use more hands, Anselm. You're always welcome. You know that. I smiled at the boy who'd become a man since last we met. Leo was at least five years my junior, but had grown a lot these past years. He was the heir to his father's kingdom, and we'd grown up together. Mother, Marianne, and Cass all got along famously, as did our fathers, so we were as close as blood cousins. We'd spent many long winters and short summers together. We'd seen each other through childhood and adolescence, and now as young adults, we were ready to see what the future held for each of us. Vanya, Jessa, and I were the oldest of the lot, but age seemed irrelevant when we all got on so well. We sat down to a morning tea, laughing and chatting and telling stories. It was great being around the people that I considered my family, both blood and bonded. The darkness in my heart, that aching loneliness, receded at times like this. When there was a lull in the conversation, I looked toward my mother. Weren't you going to tell us a story of something that happened here? Mom's eyes widened, then she nodded. Yes. She turned to my father, who was seated beside her. I told Anselm that you once fought to the death to save me. Would you like to tell the story? My father's surprise was a palpable thing. His eyes widened, then he stared at my mother, speechless. She turned back to me to explain his reaction. The three of us, Stavrock, Marianne and I, agreed we'd never tell you all this story, but I think it's time. Now I was more confused than ever. I stared at my father, who was still as silent as I'd ever seen him, and was staring at Mom with a quizzical frown bending his brows. Finally, he spoke. Lucy, I trust you with my life, so if you think it's a good idea to tell the children. As long as it's okay with you also, Marianne, Mom asked, casting her question across the table toward my aunt. Marianne and Eric stared at each other for a long moment, then they nodded in unison. What on earth is going on? Jessa demanded, crossing her arms over her large belly. I laughed out loud at her obvious annoyance. If Jessa doesn't know, this must be one huge secret. Oh, it was never meant to be a deliberate secret that we kept from you all, my father said. We just put that part of our life behind us after you were born. Shall we leave? Theo asked, standing up next to his mother, Cass. Perhaps we shouldn't. Oh, sit down. Cass pulled her son back to his seat. I was there for all of this. I know the story. And it's a good one. 
So go on, Stavrok. Tell it. My father, now in his mid-sixties, sighed heavily as he sat back in his chair and began to tell us all his story. It feels like yesterday, but thirty-one years ago, I was unmated. Cass slid forward and interjected. Other than Damon, he was the only unmarried king, and the elders wanted him to hurry up and find his queen. I smiled at my dad's cousin. Cass had often looked after us when we were little, and I had great affection for her. Yes, anyway. I held a dinner at the castle, and all the kings came, including Marianne and... Dad glanced toward Marianne, who finally joined in the conversation. My first husband, King Magnic. My half-brother, Eric said. Silence descended, and my sisters and I looked at each other, gobsmacked. Marianne had been married to King Eric's older brother. Seriously? Barry asked, the youngest of Cass's sons. Cass flicked her son in the arm. Yes, seriously. What happened? I asked, a sudden tightness in my chest squeezing a little harder. Mother had pushed for this story to come to light for me, and I wasn't going to miss any of the important details. The older adults exchanged glances, then Marianne spoke. Magnic was a power-hungry, evil man. He wanted Stavrok's lands as well as his own, and when he found that he couldn't buy the lands from him... Of course not! Vanya exclaimed, sounding horrified at the idea that our father would sell even a small part of our precious home. Why would Dad sell our land to any of the other kings? How ridiculous! Exactly, Marianne said with a small smile. But Magnic wouldn't be put off. When I told Stavrok about Lucy, and he went and stole her away from the human realm. Thanks again for that, Marianne, Mom interjected with a grin. We all laughed, lightening the mood, though my stomach remained tight with expectation. I had a feeling I knew where this was headed. Magnic took mother, didn't he? I asked. I stared at Marianne, who nodded, her cheeks darkening with a blush. Yes, and I'm sorry to say I didn't free her when I could have. Don't you dare blame yourself, Mom said, her tone brooking no argument. He was an abusive husband, and you helped me as much as you could. And look how it all worked out. Mom gestured to the large table, filled with two and a half generations of royal dragon bloodlines. Marianne rubbed her forehead, just above her right eye, as though she had a headache. Well, as you can all imagine, Stavrok didn't take it lying down. Dad groaned. She was my fated mate, and although we didn't know it yet, pregnant with my heirs. What else was I going to do but get her back? I stared at my father, my heart thumping faster now. What did you do, Dad? My father was a fit man who still trained daily. I knew he had once been a strong fighter, but without war, I'd never seen my father truly unleashed. Dad met my gaze with an unwavering intensity. I flew here, to Magnix Castle. He had Lucy tied to a pole as bait, and he wanted to kill me. We fought. I glanced at Jessa, who sat beside me, both of us putting the ending together. Magnic was gone, and Eric had ascended the throne. Did that mean? And you won, Dad, Vanya asked, her voice breathy and hopeful. Dad's grin split his face. Of course I did. I stared at my father. And by win, you mean? I needed to hear him say it. Had my father, the calm and gentle king I'd always known, killed another dragon? but it was Cass who spoke. Your father killed him, of course. She tusked loudly. He took out those foolish humans who dared to kidnap and torture my sister-in-law, too. He what? It was Barry again, so Cass launched into another story featuring Marianne's foretelling, fated mates, and my father's protective nature. By the time that story was finished, Dad was actually looking embarrassed. Okay. Okay. You can start telling stories about something else now. 
Cass grinned at her cousin. Okay. Well, how about how you and Eric battled the wolves to save the Winter Kingdom? The wolves? I asked, staring at Cass for more information before turning back to study my father. Suddenly, I was seeing him in a whole new light. He had rescued my mother from what sounded like an abusive tyrant, fought off wolves. Oh, for pity's sake. Dad groaned, then picked up his glass of wine and lifted it high. I'd like to make a toast. I made a mental note to ask my father more about his war stories, but didn't try and do so now. Instead, everyone at the table grabbed for their glass or filled it to the brim. Dad stood up and raised his wine glass high. To us. Three of the royal families of fire and ice. Long may we find great love and defend our thrones, our lands and our families to the very end. Hear, hear. We clinked our glasses and drank just as a bevy of servants entered the room and began to serve lunch. I glanced across the table at my mother, who was beaming with pride and happiness. It had always been hard to see my mom and dad as anything more than my parents. Even seeing them in their roles as king and queen sometimes felt strange to me. But now my eyes were open. They'd lived a whole life before we were born, and it had been filled with more danger and greater battles than I'd ever known. I could only hope that Marianne would set me on the same path as she had my father. The road to my mate, and the love I so desperately craved. Chapter 3 Anselm It was evening, after dinner and a day filled with laughter and games, that I finally managed to get Marianne alone. We were all relaxing in the small dining room, where the fire blazed and the alcohol flowed. I walked over to the sorceress, who was watching her son and daughter-in-law cuddle by the fireplace. Aunt Marianne, may I speak to you for a moment? She turned toward me, her eyes shimmering with her magic. I've been waiting for you to come and speak to me, Anselm. I chuckled and crossed my arms over my chest, to hide my sudden awkwardness. Has my mother spoken to you, then? She shook her head. No. But I've been feeling a buzz about you all day. You want to speak to me about your future, don't you? I nodded, my breath catching in my throat. I do. She sighed. I'm happy to help, Anselm. But you need to know, I don't have a lot of control over what happens or what I see. I can be lucky, and the information is ready and waiting for me, but it's been a long time since I tapped into this sort of power. I gave her my full attention. Please. I need to find out who she is, then I can go find her. Marianne searched my eyes, a smile lifting her lips. You're so like your father. His need for a mate tore him apart. I ran a hand through my already frazzled hair. I had been doing that a lot lately. The frustration was intense. I haven't gotten that bad yet, I don't think. But it's getting there, I admitted. Marianne nodded once. Give me a moment to tell Eric what we're doing, then we'll retreat to the library for a chat. I watched her go, then my gaze fell on my mother, who was watching me intently. I smiled reassuringly and nodded, hopefully communicating correctly that Marianne had offered to help. I wasn't reassured, however. I was worried. Terrified, in fact, that she wouldn't be able to help me. Marianne was my last hope, and if she couldn't see anything, then that would leave me with nothing but this gnawing depression that ate at my heart and grew larger every day. When Marianne came back, she took my arm and led me into the hallway, down a little way, then into the library. It was a huge room, the space lined with walls and walls of full bookcases. I smiled as I looked around the room. I see why Jessa loves it here so much. She always did love reading. She must spend all day in here. Marianne smiled. Yes, she does. Now, come sit by the fire. 
The lights in here were dim and the room quiet. I shivered as a premonition stole over me. This was the perfect place for a future reading. I followed her to the chairs by the fireplace and sat where she told me to. How do we do this? I asked, assuming she'd whip out some sort of spell book or crystal ball to help her see the future. I just set my intent to help you find your mate, then I hold one of your hands and tune into the magic. If there's an answer there, it will come to me. If. One of the worst words I knew. Okay, I said, ready to give her my hand whenever she asked for it. Marianne closed her eyes for a long moment. I stared at her and waited, holding my breath and counting the loud thumping of my heart in my chest. One ka-thump. Two ka-thump. Three. Then her eyes popped open, the irises swirling with a purple mist I'd never seen before. Aunt Marianne looked so different to her usual self, I couldn't control my sharp intake of breath. Whoa. That's incredible. Give me your hand. She slid to the edge of her chair. I mirrored her move and shifted forward, then reached out for her outstretched hand. The moment our palms connected, electricity shot through me and I was blinded. I closed my eyes, and inside my mind I saw images. Visions of the past. A drunken moment in time. A night I wished to forget. A night I hadn't been able to forget, no matter how hard I tried. I wanted to wish the vision away, and yet I couldn't. There she was, the woman I'd tried so hard to forget. Kayla. Marianne hissed, almost like she was in pain, then she let go of my hand, and everything snapped away. I opened my eyes, not even realizing that I'd closed them. Did you see what I saw? I asked. My voice sounded hoarse, as if I'd been shouting. You know your fated mate. You've already been with her. Oh my! You have to go! She cried out, jumping to her feet. Now! I have to go. I repeated, rising like she had. She gave me a shove in the center of my chest, then turned me toward the door. Your mate needs you. Desperately. It's a matter of life and death, Anselm. She isn't going to survive the... Marianne shook her head, as though she didn't want to say any more. Automatically I raced for the door before I stopped and twisted around. What are you saying, Marianne? She couldn't mean that Kayla was my fated mate. That was impossible. And was she in danger? Was she dying? I felt ragged from the emotions that rushed through me, but I didn't even understand them, let alone be able to process the news. How can I not have known my own mate? The human woman from the bar, she said, her voice sounding a little strange. She is your mate, but you didn't recognize her when you should have. She blames you for leaving. Oh my. Anselm, you really screwed that up. You need to go to her. Now. Before it's too late. She didn't need to tell me again. With the shock of her revelation echoing in my mind, I started running, back to the room where our families were. My parents were on their feet the moment I entered. I called out to them from the doorway. I have to go. Where to? Mom asked. The human realm. I have to. I ran a hand through my hair, feeling despair claw at me. Of all the women to have wronged, Marianne burst into the room. Anselm, you need to go. Tonight. Now. I turned to the sorceress finally seeing the full might of her power that everyone talked about. It rippled around her, a palpable thing in this moment. Where is she? Where can I find her? She's at home, Marianne said. I'll... here. She grabbed for my forearm, and coordinates exploded into my mind. The same town I had visited last time. Which street, though? Marigold Road. Red brick. Small house. 
Marianne moaned and let go of my arm. I haven't got anything more. I lunged forward and hugged her tight, holding her up to prevent her from staggering sideways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then I let her go and started running up to the balcony I'd landed on when I first arrived. I reached the large glass doors and began undressing faster than I ever had before. My dad was hard on my heels. I'll come with you. I turned around as I unbuttoned my shirt and tossed it to the carpet in my haste. No, I know the way. I've been there before. Dad frowned. When? I don't. He'd never given us permission. It was true. Didn't change the fact that we'd gone. I flew across the veil with Ian. We never told you. My father's glare was mighty, as I'd expected. When? he demanded. Last summer. Seven, eight months ago. My father was nodding, breathing hard. His eyes were flashing yellow, his shifter flying up to the surface. He was trying to control his temper, but I just didn't have time for this. Dad, when I get back you can sit me down and lecture me. Punish me. I don't care. But I have to go. Now. I dropped the rest of my clothes to the ground and pushed open the door to the balcony. The cold air whipped around me, and my dragon surged to the surface. Dad ran onto the balcony after me. There's a cabin just beyond the veil where you can get clothes. They'll help you. I nodded, speech impossible now that I was a dragon. We'd managed to carry clothes with us last time, between Ian and I. We'd gone with a clear head, decided first what we'd do and with a plan to execute. Pity that plan had gone to shit. Dad backed toward the door and lifted his hand in a wave of farewell. Good luck, son. Hopefully we'll see you very soon. I turned to face the ledge and dove straight over the side of the castle wall. I didn't spin and play the air currents this time. Instead, I flapped my wings hard and headed straight for the veil that separated our two worlds. My fated mate was human, which I'd always assumed. But it was Kayla. Kayla! With her gorgeous smile and warm, luscious body. I'd met my mate, and then I'd left her behind. Abandoned her. I growled into the breeze, remembering her face, the way her body had squeezed me tight. She'd given my soul solace that night, but I'd been too drunk to find out where she lived. Too wasted to even get her last name. My brother had dragged me home, and I'd added Kayla to my long list of one-night stands and tried to forget her. The veil shimmered in front of me. The sky was dark, being nighttime, but my dragon vision was ten times better than my human eyes, and I saw the portal clearly. I flew straight through the portal to the human world, the heat of a spring in the human realm hitting me hard. I began to drop, soaring into the fields of the farms outside the closest town. I landed on the warm dirt and let go of my dragon body, shifting back to human. Kayla, I whispered. I can't believe it. But part of me could. That one night with her had haunted my dreams. Her tender care, the way her eyes had shone when she smiled at me. But I'd assumed that I'd know my fated mate on sight. Everyone I spoke to said that when you met your fated mate, your dragon was uncontrollable. I hadn't had that issue with Kayla, so it had never come up in my mind. Even if the sex had been phenomenal, and part of me had desperately wanted to throw Kayla over my shoulder and take her home with me, I hadn't because all the signs for my fated mate weren't there, and that's what I'd wanted. My mate. My love. I marched toward the nearest farmhouse which had a solitary light above the old door. I was a naked male in the middle of nowhere, and I desperately hoped my father was right and I wasn't about to be arrested. Or worse. Shot. I lifted my hand to knock on the door when my eyes caught a sign attached to a large box by the front door. It read, Dragons, please take whatever clothes you need, and Godspeed. 
I chuckled as I lifted the lid on the large wooden chest by the door. Inside were neatly folded shirts, pants, jeans and jackets. I grabbed what I needed. A pair of jeans that were a little tight and a light blue shirt which was too big. They weren't perfect, but they were clothes. Those and a pair of boots were all I needed. I set off walking toward the nearby town, glad to have the time to think. To call it a town was probably too generous. It was more of a village, but even so, it had officially produced more fated mates for dragon royalty than anywhere else in the human realm. The list was growing. I began to tick them off as I walked. Mom, Sarah, Katerina, and now Kayla. Was there something special in the water around here? Or had fate decided it was time to mix more human blood into our dragon shifter lineage and allowed our mates to flourish in a place that was easy to access from our realm? I didn't have the answers, but I had a hell of a lot of questions. I continued walking down the road and into the town proper. The small, semi-identical houses lined the streets and due to the lateness of the hour, most of the homes didn't have any lights flickering in the windows. I followed some strange sense of knowing that lay within me, walking past the centre of the town and then turning off the main road and down a side street. I was looking for a sign, quite literally, that would take me to Kayla's house. I walked past a food market that was currently dark and silent, then stepped past a butcher's shop and a bakery. I was about to cross the street and continue past the remaining shops on the other side, but there it was, right above my head. Marigold Road. My heart began to pound as I turned into Kayla's street and hurried on toward her home address. I didn't know the number, but I knew what the house looked like thanks to Marianne's vision. I walked until I found it. A small, single-story red brick house. And there was a light in the window. She was home. And she was awake. Chapter 4 Kayla My back was killing me. I couldn't sleep. Not for love nor money. Because of the baby, I couldn't take anything for the pain, so I didn't bother trying to sleep. I just bounced on the gym ball the doctor had suggested and rolled my hips around and around. This bloody baby needed to come out. Like, now. There was a knock on the door, and I glanced up at the clock on the wall. 10.11 p.m. Who on earth would be coming to see me at this time of night? I checked my cell phone for any missed calls or messages. Nothing. The knocking sounded again. I used the ball to bounce myself to my weary feet, then waddled over to the front door. The security peephole made it easy to look through, but it was dark on the doorstep. I needed light to see who it was. I set up my cell phone to dial for help if I needed it, and flicked on the light. No! I gasped out, my voice denying the truth of what my eyes were seeing. Anselm, the drunken worm, was on my doorstep. My heart began to pound. I gripped my belly hard, the baby Anselm put inside me kicking out, stronger than I'd ever felt before. Was the baby responding to my emotions? The upshot in blood pressure? Or was it something else? Surely to God, my baby couldn't sense his or her father nearby. I know you're in there, Kayla. Please open the door. I shivered and turned around, pressing my back against the solid wood of the front door. Shit! I just want to talk to you. To apologize. Please. Let me in. I rubbed my belly harder, round and round in circles, while I tried to think of a way out of this. I hadn't told him about the baby that had been conceived from our one-night stand. Whether or not I would have told him was moot. I didn't have his cell number or his last name. Not to mention the fact that he'd simply vanished seemingly into thin air after that night. There had been no way to find out who he was or where he lived. No way to let him know about the consequences of our night together. I stood up straighter, taking short, sharp breaths while I tried to calm down. 
Go away, Anselm. I don't want to talk to you. Such an unusual name for a man, but then the name matched the man. He was so beautiful it hurt to look at him. I wasn't usually one to go for pure looks, especially not pretty boys like him. But the night we'd met I hadn't been able to control myself, and now look where I was. Pregnant and alone. Kayla, please. He called again, knocking three times. I sighed. Okay, not so alone anymore. At least, right this minute. He wasn't going away, that was for certain. He'd found me, and I was going to have to deal with this. Now. I reached for the deadbolt and clicked it open. Then I removed the chain, sliding it along and unclipping it. I'd imagined this moment so many times, when I would finally confront him about his disappearing act. Those thoughts used to keep me up at night. Now it was my bladder waking me at all hours of the morning. I took a deep breath, though my stomach twisted and my heart pounded with sickening lurches against my ribs. Here goes. I pulled open the door, a glare firmly entrenched on my face. He was standing on the stoop in clothes that didn't fit him, nor did they suit him. Have you been raiding the Goodwill bins or something? His blue eyes struck my face, leaving me breathless. He'd had the same effect the first time I met him. And despite all the anger and resentment I'd built up over the last eight months, seeing him again felt so good. Too good. I hauled up the walls around my heart, reaching for the feelings of anger and betrayal that I'd kept burning for so long. What are you doing here? I asked. But he wasn't looking at my face anymore. His gaze had dropped to my swollen belly, where his child shifted and kicked as though it were on display at the local fair. You're pregnant. His mouth gaped open, and his eyes were wide in complete astonishment. I crossed my arms over my chest, not the easiest feat, when my boobs literally sat on my belly now. No shit, Sherlock. So he wasn't here because someone had told him about my pregnancy. Interesting. It's mine. He sounded as sure as a man had ever been. No. It's mine, I said. You left. You didn't give a shit about me or this baby, so I... Ah. Oh. Pain hit me low down, hard. A large cramp was the best way to describe it, but it took my breath away. You, you need to come home with me. My mother will know what to do. I tried to laugh but had to breathe through the pain instead. When the cramp finally subsided, I managed to say, Your mother? Are you serious? What's she going to do? I'd been having some cramps all day, but nothing like this. Anselm was breathing strangely. I narrowed my eyes at him as I finally straightened to my full height once more. Are you okay? Was he having some sort of panic attack or something? I wouldn't be surprised. I'd almost had a conniption the day I found out I was pregnant. He shook his head, his hands tightening into fists. We have to go. Do you have a snow jacket? Something warm to wear? I rolled my eyes at him. It was spring and the weather was fine. What was he talking about? Anselm, I think you need to go home and come back another time. Another tightening in my belly told me that the next time I saw him, there might be two of us. He shook his head rapidly, then pinned me with his gaze. What's wrong with your eyes? They weren't blue anymore. How was that possible? Anselm took a step closer and I took one back. Not because I was actually afraid of him, but because he was acting so intensely. Listen to me, Kayla. I am a dragon shifter from another realm. You're my mate, and I am inches away from losing control. I need you to rug up as warm as you can, lock the house, and come with me. I laughed, because honestly, what other reaction could I have? A dragon? What? Shifter, he gasped out. I don't believe you. 
When he looked at me this time, his eyes were pure silver. I'll prove it to you. Get dressed in your warmest clothes and... Is there something you can sit in that I can carry? He began glancing around, then pointed at my car. That's perfect. Get dressed. Buckle yourself in. Then we have to go. Why do I always fall for the crazy ones? There was only one thing for it, and that was to call his bluff. I threw my hands up in the air. Fine. But when you don't turn into some fire-breathing dragon, you go away. He nodded strangely, his breathing rapid and fast. He was shaking like someone off their meds, and I slammed the door shut, just to make a point. I was not happy that he had just turned up out of the blue like this and started spouting nonsense at me. Why, baby? Why? I asked, then groaned as the baby kicked out at me. Fine, I muttered. But you know he's crazy. I waddled to my bedroom and pulled out my warmest jacket. I managed to just do it up around my huge belly, then slid my feet into my only pair of fur-lined boots. I was almost out the door when my gaze caught on my packed hospital bag. I didn't need it, of course. He wasn't carrying me anywhere. But something, a cosmic nudge from the universe, told me I shouldn't leave the house without it. I rubbed my belly again. Almost forty weeks pregnant, I probably should keep this bag in the car anyway. Now that I had a good and logical reason to take the bag, I picked it up and opened the door. Anselm had stripped off his baggy shirt and was now standing on my front lawn in nothing but those two tight jeans. I groaned and tried to look exasperated, but the truth was I could barely drag my eyes from his amazing form. What man looked like that outside of a magazine? He was freaking huge. His shoulders were even bigger than the last time I saw him. I lifted my chin, despite the fact I felt as fat as a hippopotamus, and waddled over to my tiny car. It was four doors, barely, and had next to no trunk space. I desperately needed an upgrade, but hadn't been able to afford all the baby expenses and a new car. So I'd invested in a great pram and intended to lose some of the excess weight I'd put on walking around town and doing my shopping that way. You're going to feel really stupid soon, I said, throwing my bag in the back seat, then squeezing into the driver's side. My spare keys were in the baby bag, so if he went any more nuts on me, I'd just drive away. Not easy with my belly almost touching the steering wheel, but I'd do it if I had to. The local police were only a few blocks away. I lifted the lever to slide the chair back, to give myself more room, then rubbed my belly slowly as I forced myself to take deep breaths. Even that small amount of exercise made me pant. Anselm dropped his face next to the window. Buckle yourself in. And don't be afraid. I'll never let anything happen to you, or our child. He was serious, and the tone he was using was beginning to worry me. Okay, I managed. He was delusional, after all. He had to be. And the best way to prove to him that he was delusional was to ask him to show me the dragon and watch him fail. Right? I was sure that's what I'd seen on a TV show. Or something like it. Anselm stepped back, and I watched him through the side window. And what I saw wasn't possible. He began to change and transform. He grew so tall I couldn't see his head through the car's window, not that I wanted to see his head anyway. His belly was scaled and grey in colour, and his wings. Oh my God! No way! He has fucking wings! My heart pounded, and my baby rolled and kicked in seeming excitement. I hoped the kick of adrenaline wasn't hurting my baby at all. I reached for the door handle to try and get out, but Anselm took a step toward me, and I froze. Was it even him anymore? Would he recognize me? Or would he hurt me if I tried to run away? The dragon, because honestly, there was no other word to describe the creature that was standing right in front of me, 
flapped his wings and flew up into the air. I gulped down the scream that rose and closed my eyes. It's gone. It's okay. It's gone. I rubbed my belly in calming circles, though my heart hammered loudly in my chest. Calm down. Calm down. A loud bang, like something had landed on the roof, made me scream out, terror shooting through my veins. I reached for the door handle and tried to push it open, but now a long talon held it closed, stretching over the top of the door and across the window. No! No, no! I pushed again and let out another yelp as the car lifted into the air. My arms flung out, pushing against the door and the seat beside me. I closed my eyes and began to chant. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. I was shaking with fear and knew I had to be in a dream. But God, did it feel real. I opened my eyes again and my jaw dropped. We were high, like really high in the air. My stomach swooped and I retched, trying not to be sick. There was a bottle of water beside me. I reached for it, my hands shaking as I popped the top and took a sip. Then another sip, trying to calm down. I put my seatbelt on, right? I checked, and I'd done that one strange thing he'd asked me to do. Thank God. Not that a seatbelt was going to save me if he dropped us from this height, but at least I wasn't going to accidentally fall out the door. How the hell was I going to wake up from this dream? By having a heart attack, probably, but that certainly wasn't the best way. I had to just force myself to wake up. Wake up. Wake up! I slapped my cheeks and blinked rapidly. Come on! I slid my fingers down to the steering wheel, then moved my hands slowly around the car, grounding myself and trying not to think about the distance to the ground. If he dropped me, I was dead. There was no other possible ending for me or my baby. Anselm's words echoed in my head. I'll never let any harm come to you or our baby. I tried to let that reassure me and dropped into my meditative breathing. I closed my eyes and focused on my body, my hands, my feet, my legs, my belly. I slowed everything down, trying to stay calm. I was sweating from stress and began to unfasten my jacket. The moment I opened the jacket, I shivered. That was strange. It wasn't cold out tonight. I opened my eyes and peered out. Snow was falling onto the windscreen. What the hell? I reached out to touch the glass and found it cold. Where the hell are we? Because I was almost certain we weren't anywhere near my hometown anymore. Chapter 5 Anselm I beat my wings as hard as they would go. The combined weight of the car and my mate was by far the heaviest I'd ever carried. But I pushed on, through the veil and beyond, soaring on the cold air and using the gusts of wind to help us toward home. I wasn't sure if my parents would be back from the Black Mountains yet, or if taking Kayla to Marianne was smarter than going back to my family castle. But as pain ripped through my leg muscles and my wings strained against the downward weight, I realized I had no choice. My home was closer, and the only option. I wouldn't make it to the Black Mountains. Despite the turmoil of emotion inside my head, I tried to focus on only one thing. Getting my mate and our child to safety. I couldn't slip, nor could I land wrong. The normal place for the royals was the top balcony on the highest level of the castle. I wasn't sure the car would fit safely on the balcony, and even if it could fit into that tight space by some miracle, I wasn't sure I could land there safely. I scanned the horizon for a safe place to put my mate. The land around the castle was heavily populated with streets and homes, but further out were fields of crops and snow. My gaze fixed on a field near the entrance to the castle, where freshly fallen snow was covering the ground. That was where I would have to land. I soared lower, hearing Kayla's muffled shrieks rising up from the car beneath me. 
I had no idea how she was going to react when I actually landed, but my dragon didn't care. All he cared about was the fact that my mate was now safe, with us, and about to birth the next generation of dragon kings. We got lower and lower, the snow falling hard and fast. I fluttered my wings at high speed, hovering just above the ground so that I could set the car down as gently as possible. As soon as the wheels touched the ground, I let go of the weight of the car, and it sunk down onto the tires. I launched myself forward so I didn't land on top of the car, and collapsed in the snow in front of the hood. My breath was heaving. Thank God she drove a mini-automobile. I would never have been able to carry her inside of one of those larger cars that look like an armoured tank. Kayla flicked a switch and started the engine. Oh, crap. She was trying to run from me, but her car wouldn't make it far in this snow. I had to stop her before she hurt herself. She flicked on the car's headlights, effectively blinding me. I turned my head away, still breathing hard. My dragon was exhausted, but extremely satisfied with the results. We had our mate in the land of fire and ice. That's what my father called our realm. I let go of my shifter, transforming back to my human body, the freezing cold night air hitting my naked skin like a thousand needle pricks. Kayla's car was still on, the engine humming and the lights focused on me. But she wasn't driving anywhere. Not yet, anyway. I lifted my hand to shield my eyes and called out, I'm going to walk over before I freeze to death, Kayla. She could be hyperventilating, or so mad she'd punch me as soon as I opened the passenger door. Either way, I was getting in that car. I was ready and willing to handle anything she threw at me. I hurried over the icy ground to the passenger side of the car. The door was initially stuck, but with a bit of tugging and swearing I managed to yank it open and jump inside, shivering as the warmth of the car's heat events passed over my almost frozen skin. Damn, it's cold out there. Kayla had her hands wrapped around the steering wheel, her knuckles white in a death grip. Anselm! She ground out between gritted teeth. Where the hell are we? I turned to her, trying to keep my tone calm. We crossed the veil into my realm. It's usually hidden, and not many humans know it exists. Humans! She repeated the word with a strange note in her voice, as though I said something wrong. Yes, we're not human. We're dragon shifters. As you just saw. She'd asked me to prove I really was a fire-breathing dragon, though I hadn't really shown her the fiery part yet. She was nodding and gulping, her throat making a weird noise. I reached out to touch her arm, but she practically shoved my hand away. Hey, are you okay? She twisted to face me, her dark eyes flashing. Am I okay? Did you just really ask me that? No, I am not okay. I am freaking out. I cannot be here. This has to be a dream. I was warm enough now, thanks to the heater in Kayla's car doing an admirable job, but we couldn't stay here forever. It's not a dream, I told her, as softly as I could. But we're going to leave the car and go inside the castle gates. This car won't keep us warm very long in this climate. Not to mention the fact that I was naked and there weren't any clothes for me to change into in her car. Kayla glanced down at my body as though she could hear my thoughts, then groaned loudly. You're going to get arrested for public indecency. I couldn't help but laugh, which earned me a glare and a punch in the arm from my feisty human mate. I'm sorry, I said, unable to remove the grin from my face. But there's no such thing here. All of our people, well, most of them anyway, can shift into dragons at whim. Nudity is not a big deal in our community. It is natural and normal, though not advisable in this weather. Kayla turned toward the windscreen which was now covered in snow. What is with the winter landscape? Are you guys behind us in seasons or something? I shook my head. No, we are in spring here also, but there is snow and ice almost all year round. 
my father calls our country the land of fire and ice, for the dragons and the snow. Kayla was nodding again in that weird way she had, with her wild eyes and gulping in her throat. So you're saying that I really am in some strange land with dragons and castles? Oh my god, I feel like I travelled back in time or something. I laughed softly. You'll feel like that inside the castle. We don't have a lot of technology, choosing a simpler life for our people and ourselves. Kayla wiped at her eyes, where tears fell onto her cheeks. I reached for her, and this time she didn't push me away. It's going to be okay, Kayla. No, it's not. She sobbed, and my whole heart broke for her obvious confusion and fear. But what she didn't understand yet was that she was the mate to the future king, and her every whim and desire would be granted for the rest of her life. Let's get you inside, I said, squeezing her arm. You're probably exhausted and need a hot shower and a warm bed. I'm not sleeping with you. Ow! She grimaced, then rubbed her big belly. Bloody baby is so ready to come out. I made a quick calculation in my head and came up with a scary number. You'd be almost nine months now, wouldn't you? She lifted her head and looked into my eyes, and there I saw all the shadows and doubts that I would need to chase away. Yes, I'm thirty-nine weeks. I wasn't sure what that was in human terms, but it was very obvious that both my mate and her babe would be much happier when the pregnancy was over. Well, neither of us wants you to have the baby in this tiny car, so how about you button your coat and we walk to the castle? She wiped at her face, then reached for a tissue from the console to blow her nose. What about you? Won't you freeze? I shook my head. My temperature runs hotter than a human. I'll be fine as long as I can get inside relatively soon. Dragon shifters in their human form could survive naked several hours in temperatures like this. Longer if we had to. She shook herself and took some deep breaths, like she was pumping herself up to conquer a huge task. Okay. Can you get the baby bag from the back seat and let's go see this castle? God, I never thought I'd say that in real life. I grabbed the large duffel bag that she pointed to in the back seat and opened the car door to get out. She wasn't moving, though. Are you coming with me? Kayla looked over at me. Can't you just fly me home? Put me back into my warm bed. I promise I'll never come after you for maintenance, and you can forget about us completely. I so wanted to lean over and kiss her lips. I'd reassure her that I was never leaving her again. But that wasn't what she wanted to hear, so I kept those thoughts to myself. Even if I wanted to, which I don't, I said. I'm exhausted. I could never carry that car back through the veil. You'd have to ride on my back, which in your condition is probably not the best idea. Her eyes widened, and then she shrieked. Are you telling me I'm stuck here? Oops. No, no. I just think that consulting my mother might be the best thing here. She's human and has more knowledge than I do about your anatomy. I'd never understood before how Lucian, King Damon's half-brother, had been able to live in the human world with his mate for a time. But now that I knew firsthand about the strength of the mate bond, I knew I'd do anything to keep Kayla by my side. Anything. Your mother's human, Kayla squeaked, and I nodded. Did your father carry her through the veil against her will as well? I presumed she was half-joking, at least about me taking her against her will, since Kayla had actually asked me to shift and prove I was a dragon. She didn't ask you to carry her here. Shut up. I answered her honestly. Well, yes, actually. He tracked her down since she is his fated mate, and when he shifted, she fainted. And he kidnapped her, Kayla asked, her mouth dropping open. I laughed and turned toward the car door once more. They tell the story much better than I can. Kayla huffed. I bet. Come on. 
Let's get out of here before everyone's in bed and there's no one to open the doors for us. I jumped out of the car, Kayla's bag in hand, and hurried around to her side. She'd already managed to open the door and was hauling herself up and out of the car. Prr, it's freezing! Literally, I said, grabbing her hand. Stay close. We've lost people in blizzards like this before. She pressed into my side, and I led her in the direction of the castle gates. The guard standing at the top stared down at us with a surprised frown. I called up to him. It's me, Thomas. Can you open the castle gates for us? Oh, yes, sire. The guard ran off to do my bidding. What did he call you? Kayla asked. I didn't get to answer her because she was too busy gaping at the entry to the castle as the huge gates opened slowly. They pushed the snow into massive piles each side of the entrance and revealed our small village within, containing quaint homes and cobblestone streets. Wow! It's like a medieval fairy tale, Kayla whispered. I chuckled. Yes, but with electricity and good plumbing. We don't have a lot of technology, but we do have both of those things. All provided by my father for the whole kingdom. No one in our land was without a roof over their head, clean water, or heating. We hurried inside the gates which closed behind us. We didn't have a lot of enemies anymore, but my father still chose to keep everything secure, and we had guards on the walls all the time. Sire, a guard called from the wall, then he threw down a long fur-lined cloak. Thank you, I called back, grabbing the thick robe and pulling it around my naked body. Well, you were certainly right about them not arresting you for being naked. She spoke with a raised eyebrow. Let's get up to the castle, I said, trying not to laugh. Okay, but go slow. She grabbed onto the hand I offered her. I'm not built to hustle at present. Oh, of course. I put my arm around her and directed her through the streets of our town and up toward the castle. By the time we got to the top of the steps, she was huffing and puffing. I hope it was worth all that trouble. What? I asked. Getting me up here. She seemed to be gasping for air. I nodded. It will be. The accommodations in the castle and the food alone are well worth the trip. She bent forward for a moment, rubbing her belly and breathing deep. You okay? She nodded, then stood straighter. Yeah. I've been getting cramps for weeks now, but it never progresses into full labor. Maybe our baby was waiting for me to arrive, I suggested, which earned me a glare of the filthiest kind. Well, if you'd bothered to call me, or contact me, or follow up even once after our night together, you could have been part of this from the start. Then her face calmed, and she shrugged with seeming nonchalance. She stared at the doors in front of us, as if she couldn't bear to face me a second longer. Now it's too late. I shook my head, my heart squeezing tight in my chest. Hoping I spoke the truth. No, Kayla. It's never too late. Chapter 6 Kayla I could barely breathe and was wheezing like a pug. I was so unfit, and this baby made things so much harder. He, or she, was squishing my lungs and my stomach, and the extra weight made my legs and lower back ache. But I'd made it up all those bloody steep streets, and now I was standing in front of huge stone doors at the top of a staircase that had almost killed me to walk up. Anselm had better be correct, and our destination worth all this physical exertion. I was avoiding thinking about the emotional stress at this point. I had a lot to process, but I didn't want rising anxiety to adversely affect the baby. Anselm walked over to the doors and knocked loudly using the large, ornate knocker. I quirked an eyebrow at him, aiming for humour, even though I still couldn't breathe properly. You don't have a key? He laughed. This door can only be opened from the inside. Hmm, why would they do that? Security, maybe. 
The doors opened, and a man dressed in black robes stepped out into the snow. He looked like a servant, especially when he bowed low before he spoke. Prince Anselm, we were not expecting you tonight, sire. Sire, prince, oh my god, no. Tell me you're not who they're saying you are. Anselm, the cheeky bugger, didn't answer the question. Instead, he grinned at me before putting an arm around my waist and drawing me inside. Come on, it's much warmer in here. I forced my aching legs to keep moving and waddled into the foyer. Then I stopped and stared around the entrance area, shocked at how beautiful everything was. The floors were marble and plush red carpets ran up an enormous staircase. Where the hell are we? You actually live here, I asked, but he wasn't listening. He was talking to the man who'd let us in the front door. I turned away from him and took my time absorbing my surroundings. The lights were dimmed, probably due to the late hour, and there was mostly silence in the background, but God, it was all so beautiful. Suddenly I yawned loudly, unable to help myself, and covered my mouth with my hand. The adrenaline from earlier was beginning to leach out of my system, and the fact that it was past midnight and I was practically nine months pregnant began to weigh on me. When Anselm finished his conversation and walked over once more, I spoke up. I'm sorry, but I think I need to lie down pretty soon. He nodded. Of course. And please don't apologize. I imagine this has all been a lot to take in. The servants are getting my sister's room ready for you. It's next to mine, so if you need me during the night, I won't be far. He indicated with his hand that I should follow, so I did. I didn't need a fancy room. All I needed was one of the couches we passed and a blanket. I was practically falling asleep on my feet. Somehow my back wasn't sore anymore and my body was relaxed, more than it had been in months. I had no idea how that was possible, since I'd done nothing but fight and scream while I was carried here, but it was true. Was it the cold air and unfamiliar environment that had shocked my system out of its aches and pains? Or was it something more complex? Something to do with the man, dragon, shifter, or whatever he was, who had brought me here and seemed determined to look after me and our baby? We walked down a long hallway, then Anselm stopped in front of a wooden door. This is my sister Jess's old room. Mine is there. He pointed at a door about fifteen feet further down the hallway. I crossed my arms over my chest, suspicious as hell. There's no adjoining door, right? Not that a man like him would likely want to force himself on a woman who probably weighed more than he did, but still, I had to ask. He tilted his head and frowned at me. Between siblings? That would be weird. I didn't have the brain power to explain, so I just asked. Your sister won't mind if I sleep here. He shook his head. No, not at all. My parents and both of my sisters are visiting family friends and will be gone for the next few days. Okay. I didn't have anything else left in me to fight him. There was a bed inside this room and it was calling my name. I pushed open the door to the most opulent bedroom I'd ever seen. It rivaled every magazine cover ever. In the middle of the room was a huge four-poster bed with white draping curtains and golden blankets thrown over the coverlet. Wow, I... I was literally speechless. Let me tuck you in. Anselm took my hand and tugged me inside. There was only a single light illuminating the room a gold lamp on the bedside table. Tuck me in. You don't need to do that, I grumbled, shoving off my large, warm coat and sitting down on the plush bed. I've been putting myself to bed alone for a long time. I kicked my feet out of my fur boots, or tried to, but my right foot got stuck. Shit. I reached down to shove at it, or at least I tried to, but had issues bending because of my belly. Anselm knelt at my feet. Allow me. He gently pulled at both boots and they easily slipped from my feet. 
Then he set them to the side, stood up, and rolled back the bed covers for me. I was too exhausted to be angry or fight him. I crawled beneath the blankets, so soft and warm, and put my head on the pillow. The whole bed felt like a giant cloud folding around me. Oh, this is heaven! I rolled onto my side, grabbed one of the many pillows and tucked it between my knees, and closed my eyes. Anselm kissed my forehead lightly, a mere brushing of his lips against my skin. The sensation sent a frisson of something delightful through my body, but I was so tired and confused that I couldn't quite grasp what it was. I've missed so much, my beautiful mate, he whispered. I won't miss anything more. I promise. I didn't know what to say and didn't bother trying to answer him. There was too much water under the bridge now. Surely he understood that. He clicked the lamp next to the bed and the whole room fell into darkness. I stayed awake just long enough to hear the door shut, then I slid into a deep sleep. Waking up wrapped in a cloud couldn't feel better than the place I woke up in the next morning. For the first time in far too long, I'd had hours of uninterrupted sleep. Although my bladder was now screaming at me to get up and go to the bathroom, the rest of me was rested and relaxed. The baby shifted and kicked out, obviously frustrated about being trapped inside me. He or she really seemed determined to want to come out. Okay, okay. I groaned, throwing back the covers and rolling up to a standing position. The plush carpet beneath my toes was exquisite and made the plantar fasciitis I suffered from in the mornings so much easier to bear. I pushed open one of the doors off the bedroom and found the most amazing walk-in closet. It was huge, the size of my kitchen at home. I closed it because, unfortunately, not a single thing would fit me at present, even if I was the sort of girl to borrow and wear another woman's clothes. Behind the next door, I found what I was looking for. A huge white and gold bathroom extended out the length of the closet. It had a huge bath, a walk-in shower, and a large vanity with mirror. I waddled over to the toilet and quickly sat. Peeing all the time was one of the many things I didn't like about pregnancy. I finished up, washed my hands and contemplated a shower. But with no fresh clothes to put on, there really wasn't any point. As though someone had heard my thoughts, there was a knock at the bedroom door, then a woman called out. Hello? Kayla? I turned toward the friendly voice and walked back into the huge bedroom, which showed itself to be even bigger in the daylight. Seriously? Who are these people? There was a woman laying long dresses on the bed. Rich fabrics with long sleeves and hoods that I assumed would assist to keep out the cold. Uh, hello? I answered. She turned and looked at me, her intelligent gaze taking in my size in a measured heartbeat. I can definitely alter something of the Queen's to accommodate that belly. We need you to be comfortable, don't we? Perhaps she was a dressmaker or a housekeeper. She looked about fifty with greying temples and her hair upswept into a bun on top of her head. Do we? I asked, walking back to the bed and sitting down once more my feet still aching. I stretched my legs, rolling my ankles around and wishing for the pain to subside. You must take a bath, she said. It will help with your aches and pains. I will just take a few measurements, then I'll bring you back some clothes to wear. I reached out to touch the dresses she'd already brought me. These are just beautiful. The woman, whose name I still didn't know, hummed with approval. Yes, the Queen does have nice taste. The Queen, I repeated. Was she serious? Yes. Anselm's mother, Lucy. The woman finally introduced herself. I'm Sadie. My mother has been the housekeeper here since King Stavrock was a child. Nice to meet you, Sadie, I said. You probably already know, but I'm Kayla. She nodded, then reached out her hand. Stand up. I need a measurement, then I'll be on my way. She whipped out a measuring tape, made a quick measure of my hip, belly, and bust, 
then thrust the tape back into her pocket. A true professional. I couldn't help grouching. I'm sure you won't have anything that fits me. My original body was hard enough to dress, but my belly has just made everything twice as hard. I was a size 18 to 20 anyway, and once I'd gotten pregnant, my boobs had gone up three cup sizes. Sadie tusked with disapproval. You humans, always worried about being too big. Your weight is a good thing. It gives you strength and sexuality, not to mention the ability to birth your babies well. I glanced down at my hands. I'd always been uncomfortable with my weight. No matter what I tried, it never changed. I didn't know what to say to her, so I just kept quiet. I won't be long, Sadie said. I'll draw you a bath and you can have a good soak. Then you can dress and go to breakfast with the prince. I coughed out a laugh. The prince! I can't believe! I covered my face with my hands. He's a prince! A dragon prince, but still. When I dropped my arms once more, Sadie was off in the bathroom, running me a bath. I had a feeling that she mothered the prince and his sisters, something I wouldn't mind being a part of. My own mother had died when I was a teenager, and I missed her. A lot. My dad hadn't been part of my life much, so I had little family. One of the many drawbacks about being single and pregnant, I hadn't had any family to lean on. Sadie bustled back into the room and picked up one of the dresses from the bed. The one that I'd been most drawn to. The ruby red. The queen is buxom, much like yourself, Sadie said, with a nod at my breasts. Don't underestimate the power of a beautiful body in keeping a dragon mate happy. I managed to smile at the well-meaning housekeeper and ran my hands over my baby bump. I didn't feel beautiful. I felt like a whale. Won't be long. She swept out of the room. The bathroom was beginning to steam up and the running water called to me. I looked around the beautiful bathroom and sighed. What have I gotten myself into? A man who I'd slept with eight months ago had turned up out of nowhere and swept me up, then carried me to his castle in another realm. It was like a movie, and I couldn't wrap my head around the idea that this could possibly be happening to me. Little old fat me. I shook my head and stood up, undressing for the bath. There was a long mirror on the wall, and I took a few steps toward it, grimacing at the picture that flashed back at me. My breasts were huge and grotesque now, the areola dark and stretched. My belly was gigantic, not a cute little bump like all the magazine women had. And my cellulite, I turned to the side to see my dimpled arse and thighs flash in the morning light. Damn, they were ugly. But there was no one here to see me, so I tried not to focus on how crap my appearance made me feel. Instead, I turned away from the mirror and carefully climbed into the huge bath. The warm water was like a huge hug, and I sighed as I swam over to the far side and turned over, letting myself relax into the warmth. My body was buoyed in the tub, and I floated in the bubbles, a huge feeling of relief washing over me. I lay there and enjoyed the luxury, because goodness knows when this dream was going to come to a crashing end. Chapter 7 Anselm I slept like crap all night. I tossed and turned and ached and angered. My mate was in the castle. My mate! The woman I'd scoured the earth for was literally a few steps away, in the room next to mine. The fact that she was so close had actually given me some comfort, but regret ate at me like a disease. I could have gone back for her at any time. I could have tried to contact her after I'd left her that night. But no, I'd been too ashamed in relation to my behaviour, falling into bed with a human and not telling her who I really was. Too angry at my brother for dragging me away when I'd wanted to stay. So instead, I'd missed out on loving my mate for all these months that she needed me. I hadn't seen her grow large with my child. I'd been alone, 
and so had she. Today I would propose marriage, and we would alert my parents immediately. We could have a small ceremony in the castle straight away, which would hopefully make Kayla feel wanted and desired, even after I'd ignored her for so long. My child would be the next heir to our kingdom, and he or she deserved every possibility of happiness and security. I'd been told by Sadie this morning that she would take care of Kayla and make sure she was comfortable and dressed warmly. I hadn't even thought about her clothes or anything like that. Idiot. But I was grateful to have Sadie to think of such things in my mother's absence. You'd think after growing up with twin sisters, I'd know something of a woman's needs. Obviously not. A knock on my bedroom door was followed by the entrance of my personal servant, Manny. If he played his role correctly, Manny would run the household once I ascended the throne, something Manny was ever so nonchalant about. He walked in with his characteristic grin, as informal as my father's butler was formal. So, he began, the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree, does it, your highness? I stood up and tugged on my vest. I'd dressed well today, knowing I would be proposing marriage. I didn't want to look like some sort of street urchin. How do you mean? Manny chuckled. From what I've heard, King Stavrog stole Queen Lucy from the human realm when he found her. Now you've taken your own human. I never thought you'd follow in your father's footsteps quite so closely. I groaned. It wasn't intentional, and besides, isn't it obvious that I've seen her before? Manny laughed. Oh, you mean the pregnant belly? I did wonder on that one, sire. Perhaps that happened when you and your brother went gallivanting off to the human realm for a little sneaky peek. I glared at my best friend, the man who would one day be my greatest asset. You know too much, Manny. Once again, the blue-eyed young man cackled with laughter. Not much gets past me, sire. Now, I'm here with a message from Sadie. The woman who truly ran everything around here. I walked toward the door, waiting for the message. And, I finally inquired, what did she say? She said to tell you to meet your mate for breakfast in the small dining room. Now, Kayla will be ready in a few minutes. I pushed my hair out of my eyes and nodded. It was time. Manny put his hand out and touched my shoulder, his usually joker-like face serious for once. Prince Anselm, I want to tell you how happy I am for you. Truly. I clapped my hand on Manny's shoulder. Thank you, my friend. Then we both straightened, shrugging off the camaraderie we both felt at a base level. I headed out the door of my bedroom and looked both ways. The hallway was empty, so I hurried along to the dining room, wanting to be there to greet my future wife. The dining room had been set for guests, with the good white tablecloth and the best silver. I couldn't help but smile at the obvious approval from the servants, already treating Kayla like the queen she was destined to be. I walked over to the fire where heat burst from the logs. I was still slightly chilled from last night's excursions. Carrying that car all the way from the human realm had drained my energy in a way I'd never experienced before. I was glad I'd done it, for my mate's sake. But I wasn't sure I could again if I had to. When the door finally opened, I turned toward my mate with my heart open and my expectations sky high. She was even more beautiful than I remembered. Her long dark hair cascaded over her shoulders, and her skin shone with good health. The dress they'd chosen for her suited her to perfection, hugging her large belly and accentuating her huge breasts in a way that made me want to rush over and bury my face between them. But I stayed where I was by the fire, because despite the beauty that was Kayla, she seemed unsure. Her eyes darted this way and that, as though she was expecting something, or someone, to jump out and scare her. Good morning, I called, as I meandered toward the dining table. The servants weren't sure what you liked, so they appear to have made everything on the menu. I'd never seen so much food on a breakfast table before. There were pies and fresh breads, pastries and whipped cream. 
Then, of course, there was toast and bacon and eggs. Everything and anything a person could wish for. Kayla glanced over at the abundance, her eyes wide with surprise. Oh, they shouldn't have gone to so much trouble. I rarely eat much for breakfast. That could hardly be good for her, or the babe, but I kept my opinions to myself. Well, sit and have a cup of tea, or some fresh juice, if you like. No one will be offended if you don't eat anything. I pulled out the large dining room chair, and Kayla stared at me for a moment, then shook her head and sat down. I pushed the chair in and walked around to my spot, opposite her. Is there something wrong? A soft smile played at the edges of her lips. No, it's just that you talk like you're from a medieval movie or something. And your manners are, well, they're great, but very unusual in men nowadays. I shrugged and reached for the stack of pancakes piled up next to the fresh blueberries. It may be in human men. I was taught differently. Hmm. Kayla nodded, then reached for a slice of buttered toast. You were taught to have one night stands with human women, then abandon them. Got it. My cheeks flushed with the heat of shame. You have no idea how ashamed I am of my behavior on that night and since then. She shrugged, causing her breasts to bounce and draw my eye. It doesn't matter now. What's done is done. No, it's not, I urged her. We can't go into the future with that hanging over our heads. I have to explain to you why I behaved that way. Kayla reached for the bottle of freshly squeezed juice. Go for it. I clenched my jaw tight, then slowly released it. I should have been practicing this speech. Instead, I'd spent the night angry and alone. Now was not the time for regrets. I had to explain. I took a deep breath and said, I mentioned last night about fated mates, did I not? She shook her head. No, you said I was your mate, or something. I was a little distracted by the whole dragon thing. I tried to smile at her, but my face was tight. Yes, you are my mate, my fated mate. You are meant to be my life partner, and I am meant to be yours. She frowned at me. You can't be serious. I most definitely am. I reached for some of the berries and pulled them onto my plate. The fated mate bond means that when I saw you, my dragon lost control and I had to shift. I had to bring you home with me. Are you telling me you don't have a choice on this thing? Her eyebrows were high and questioning. That fate just points to me and goes, Hey, even if you don't love her and you're not attracted to her, go marry her. A growl rolled up and out of my chest. I was attracted to you from the first moment I saw you, or I would never have put that baby in your belly. It was Kayla's turn to seem embarrassed, or that was what I assumed she was feeling, since her cheeks turned the same colour as her ruby-red dress. She reached for some fresh fruit and placed three pieces on her plate. You were saying, go back to the night we met at the club. I ran a frazzled hand through my hair, quickly realising that unless something dramatically changed, I would not be proposing marriage to my mate this morning. I honestly thought this was going to be so much easier. I've been waiting for my fated mate to appear for forever. I felt incomplete, lonely, missing you. Kayla looked up from her plate, meeting my gaze. I could feel the intensity of that look right down to the soles of my feet, and the fact that she was at least hearing my words gave me some comfort. She wasn't speaking, so I continued. I'd been told that when I met my mate I'd know. My dragon would take over, and I'd shift uncontrollably. Kayla sucked on a strawberry, making me ache. Then she said, Sort of like last night. All that shaking and carrying on. Exactly, I said, trying not to take offence at the way she pictured me. Then why didn't that happen when I met you eight months ago? I sighed, opening my arms, palm up to show my confusion. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think it was because I was so intoxicated. 
My dragon was asleep. He couldn't sense you. Kayla gasped, then rubbed her belly. Well, something was awake, because I got pregnant straight away. I nodded, a strange sort of pride blossoming in my chest. Well, you're my fated mate. It makes sense that we are compatible in every way. The memories of the sex we'd shared that night had kept me company on many nights since then. I took a sip of my fruity wine, then the thought hit me. Humans knew more about their babies than we did. Do you know what you're having? Is there more than one? More than one? She gaped at me. I bloody hope not. Then she went quiet. I know I'm huge, but that doesn't mean it's twins. She looked crushed, and that was the last thing I'd meant to do. Oh, I didn't mean to imply anything negative. I am a triplet, with my sisters Vanya and Jessa. I was only wondering in case the multiple birth thing is genetic. Kayla's hands rubbed over her huge belly, over and over. No, I'm pretty sure there's only one. I've had several scans and they all showed just one baby. I nodded. That was a good thing, for a first birth especially. Mother didn't like to talk about it, but I was certain our birth hadn't been easy for her. And do you know if it's a boy or a girl? I asked, not even sure what answer I would prefer. She shook her head vehemently. I wanted a surprise. I smiled. That was a great choice. Made the wait even more worthwhile. She was still rubbing her belly, almost like one would a magical lamp. Are you going to continue with your story, or is that it? You met me, and were so drunk you didn't realize I was your special mate person, then just disappeared forever in the morning. She was still angry, that was for sure. I had to try and explain better, make her believe how sorry I was. My younger brother, Ian, came for me during the night. He woke me up and practically dragged me home. She narrowed her eyes at me. Why would he do that? Because crossing the veil is forbidden, especially for a crown prince. We hadn't told our parents that we were going, and all hell would break loose if they found out. Kayla stood up slowly, her lips pulled tight. I'm not feeling great, so if you don't mind, I think I'll go and lie down again. Of course, I said, rushing to stand. I'll walk you back to your room. No. She pushed her hand out into the air, her voice forceful. I need a bit of time to think. I could tell that nothing I'd said had made her feel any better. If anything, it seemed I may have made things worse. Kayla. I wish I'd stayed until the morning and seen you in the early light. I wish I'd known you were my fated mate and whisked you home with me that night. She lifted her chin and stared at me with eyes as cold as the landscape outside. And if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. Then she turned and walked away, crushing my hopes of a marriage acceptance in a single breath. Chapter 8 Kayla Breakfast didn't sit well with me. Whether it was the food itself or the conversation, I wasn't sure. But I wasn't feeling great. My stomach rolled and clenched like I was on a ship. I knew that I really should lie down and rest, but I couldn't. Not with my mind and my mood on a downward spiral. I decided to keep moving and set off exploring the castle. I walked past my bedroom door and kept going, needing to stretch my legs. Before long, what had begun as gentle exercise turned into wonder. I found myself staring out the windows at the most incredible view I'd ever seen. The village beneath Anselm's castle was small and picturesque, with thatched roofs topped with freshly fallen snow. And beyond the huge gates were fields and mountains. That's where my poor car still was, in one of those fields, probably frozen beyond repair. As I pressed my palm flat against the window pane, the glass was cold to the touch. I'd never survive if I went out there alone. Even if I could escape Anselm and this strange dream I was in, 
Where would I go? The baby rolled and kicked out beneath my ribs, and I rubbed him or her through the thick winter dress. It's okay, sweetheart. We'll find a way home, and soon. I can't give birth to you here. It's not safe. A large, dark shape in the sky caught my attention, and I looked up. Wow! Flying toward us was a rather fierce-looking but breathtaking dragon. He was absolutely huge. Bigger than Anselm had been, I was sure. I took a step back, not sure where he was going to land, because it didn't look like he was headed for the village. The dragon began flapping his wings in big, slow moves as he hovered above the castle. On his back, shockingly, was a woman. She had her hood pulled over her head and was riding the dragon without fear or worry. In fact, her hand stroked the scales as though she were petting the beast between her legs. The woman turned her head suddenly and looked straight at me. Anselm's sapphire blue eyes stared back at me. My breath caught in my throat. Who is that? His mother, maybe. One of his sisters. Then the woman smiled and waved. It was truly the strangest sight I'd ever witnessed. I wriggled my fingers at her and waved back, because really, what else was I going to do? There was a woman, riding a dragon, waving at me. They disappeared from my sight as the dragon flew somewhere I couldn't see through the window. Kayla! I whirled around to find Sadie behind me. Oh, hi! I was just walking around the castle, stretching my legs, and I saw, um... Sadie nodded as though she knew exactly what I was talking about. Yes, the king and queen are home and they'll want to meet you. Would you like to change into another outfit? Or can I help prepare you in any way? I thought about the single change of clothes I had with me, packed into my hospital bag as my going home outfit. They fit me, just, but I would be freezing in no time at all. I glanced down at the dress that I was wearing. Will the Queen be upset that you altered this for me? Sadie smiled for one of the first times. The Queen doesn't get upset about such things. Oh, okay. I almost asked what would make the Queen upset, but didn't have the guts. Come, Sadie said, gesturing for me to follow her. I did, waddling as fast as I could behind the housekeeper. When we reached the door to the dining room from this morning, Anselm was waiting for us. Oh, you found her. Thank you, Sadie. I glanced toward the housekeeper and found her looking down her nose at the prince. I didn't get her for you. The king and queen are home. Anselm sighed, as though being told off by the housekeeper was a normal event. Well, thank you anyway. Sadie nodded and walked off. Anselm turned to me, his demeanour sad. I need to apologise to you once again. I should never have taken you from your home and brought you here. I wish I'd been able to control my dragon and leave you in your own realm. His words knifed my heart in a way I didn't expect, and I gasped at the unexpected pain. Well, you can take me home right now if you don't want me here. That's damn fine by me. He stepped closer and cupped my face with his hands, moving faster than I'd thought he could. No. He breathed against my lips. I should have stayed with you. Explained everything. Given you the support and love you deserve. I want you here. I never want you to go. Please stay with me. But the baby! I gulped. The birth! Our baby is part dragon, he whispered, kissing the tip of my nose. Perhaps speak to my mother about the birth before you decide you need to go home. I nodded because his words made sense and his closeness was sending my whole body into shivers of delight. Okay. He stepped back and straightened his shirt with a tug on the sleeve. I'm sorry to have to introduce you to my parents like this. I would have preferred another way. What way? I asked, even as he took my elbow and turned me toward the double door entry. As my fiance. He proceeded to pull me forward. I pulled him back as hard as I could. 
You can't just drop a bombshell on me like that, then waltz me in to meet royalty. One side of Anselm's sexy mouth curled up. Ah, I'm royalty too. Not in my book you're not. You're just mine. I whacked him in the chest. You know what I mean, so explain. What are you talking about? Anselm tilted his head, as though I should know the answer to the question. I crossed my arms over my chest and glared at him. Explain it to me. Slowly. So I can check that I understand, because I'm almost certain I didn't hear you right. I couldn't have. Surely. You're my fated mate, he said, as though it were a fact. I want to marry you and have our children grow up here, in the castle, and... Hang on a minute, I said, uncrossing my arms and putting a hand out in front of me, as though that would actually stop him from saying all these things. You expect me to stay here? Not just for today, but forever. I couldn't believe he thought I should just leave my whole life behind and stay here in this frozen palace. Who was I? Elsa? I had friends. I had a job. What about my house? He reached into his pocket and pulled out a navy blue ring box. My heart leapt in my chest and anxiety shot through my veins. No. When he opened the box to display the most beautiful diamond and emerald ring I'd ever seen, I couldn't help but gawk at it. If you married me, Anselm said, there is nothing I wouldn't give you. What about your heart? Is that mine too? Or have you given it to someone else already? Before I could even think of an answer, Anselm tilted his head to the side, snapped the box shut, and slid it back into his pocket. Someone's coming. The double doors in front of us flew open with a loud bang, and the biggest man I'd ever seen in real life stood before us. What's taking you two so long? He was handsome for a man who had to be in his sixties. Even with greying hair and wrinkles, I could see the resemblance to Anselm. Your Highness, I said, dropping into a pathetic curtsy. I'd never met royalty before, so I hadn't exactly practiced such an awkward move. Not to mention the fact that I was almost nine months pregnant and as graceful as an elephant. The king had obviously just noticed my belly because he began to stutter. Your, uh, how? Anselm? I glanced up at the man at my side. I wasn't answering that one. Could we go in, Dad? I'm sure Mom would like to hear the story, too. The king practically cackled with laughter. Hell yes, she will. Come on in. I wasn't sure I wanted to go into the dining room again. Intimidation was setting in, hard and fast. These men were royals, and they were bloody huge. How was I meant to keep my cool and not embarrass myself? Come on, Kayla, Anselm said, taking my hand and drawing me with him into the room. It's going to be all right. The woman waiting for us had a huge beaming smile on her face, and I was surprised to find her to be short and plump like me. She walked over and extended her hand. Hi, Kayla. I'm Lucy. I bobbed a little curtsy as I shook her hand. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what I meant to say or do. Lucy smiled and twisted her fingers around so that she was now holding my hand. Then she tugged me over to the couch closest to the fire. You're meant to relax and put your feet up. How far along are you? Thirty-nine weeks, I answered, my hand going protectively to my belly. The Queen stopped and stared at me. And you flew through the veil? Well, not the way you did, I said. Not on Anselm's back or anything like that. The queen turned to her son. Her smile was gone. Explain. Now. We all sat down, Lucy and I on one couch, and Anselm and his father on the other. By the time he was done explaining how we'd gotten to this exact moment in time, there was a heavy silence on the room. The moment the queen turned toward me, the silence ended. Kayla, you poor thing! You must be beside yourself. Is there anyone we should contact or call? Parents? Friends? Will anyone be missing you? 
Hot tears blurred my vision before I swiped them away. It had been so long since anyone had mothered me, I'd forgotten how good it felt. No, I'm on leave from my job, and my mom's gone. There's no one that will miss me. Not for a few days, anyway. Not for a lot longer than that. Lucy squeezed my hand. We need to get you an appointment with our doctor. Oh, I can't give birth here, I said, shaking my head. I'm booked into the hospital. I have a birth plan. Lucy patted my hand and smiled softly. Sweetheart, even if I wanted you to go, which I don't, I can't let you go to the human world to give birth to a dragon baby. My nose burned with tears again. What do you mean? Is it going to come out with scales and wings or something? There was so much I didn't know. So much I hadn't planned for. Lucy grinned at me this time. No, not at all. They come out like normal human babies, but they're big and can be difficult births. The doctors here are well versed in birthing dragon human babies, and without them, I'm not sure I would have made it through the triplet's birth. I could have a caesarean section, I said, my voice turning shrill with worry. Lucy grimaced. That's where there is a complication, and one of the few differences with dragon births. The sac the babies or baby grows in is much harder and more resilient than a human amniotic sac. A C-section may not work at all, and God knows what the doctors would do to you or your bubs if they found some miraculously tough membrane inside of you. The tears were beginning to well in my eyes once more. So you're saying I can't go home, and if I do, I could die? Or my baby could die? Lucy moved even closer, reaching out both hands to me and holding tight. This is 100% your choice, and if my stupid son has done something that you won't forgive him for, then I will stay by your side until your child is born, and then Stavrock will fly you both home safely. All right? You are not a prisoner here. A high-pitched sound of pain came from the other side of the room, and the Queen glared at whoever made it. I didn't look away from Lucy's face. I was barely keeping it together as it was. Lucy snapped at whoever she was glaring at. You're the only one that can fix this. Not me. My job is to keep this girl and my grandchild safe. I hiccuped, then covered my mouth with my hand. Your grandchild? I... You would be the only ones. My mom's gone, and my father has been out of my life for over twenty years. Well, we are in, Lucy grinned. One hundred percent. Aren't we, Stavrock? The huge dragon king walked over and sat behind his smaller wife, his face solemn. Definitely. I don't know what's happened between you and Anselm, and I pray to the gods that you sort it out and stay here as part of our family. But if you don't, I hope you would allow us to be a part of your child's life. The amount of emotion and support being shown in this moment brought a sob to my throat. I wanted to tell them yes, that of course I'd have them in my baby's life. To have such doting, wonderful grandparents would be amazing. But the words stuck in my throat, and when I tried to speak, tears coursed down my face. So instead I nodded and tried to smile through the tears. I couldn't do their kindness justice at the moment, but once I could talk again, I would. Anselm suddenly stood up, and I glanced over to his couch, only to watch him walk out of the room, the doors shutting loudly behind him. I stared after him, the baby kicking out and rolling about, in response to the sound of my heart breaking once more. Chapter 9 Anselm My parents were giving Kayla every excuse to leave our realm and cut me completely out of my child's life. Here I was, wanting my mate to stand by my side as my queen, to marry me and reign with me through all the years of our lives, and my mother was offering to take her home any time she wanted to. I could scream with the fury of it all. I marched down the hall, heading to the closest balcony so I could fly off some of the anger rolling through me. When I reached the door, 
I began to strip off the clothes I'd only donned an hour ago. A servant ran up to grab the garments from me. Thank you, Cecile, I managed to grunt out, the manners that had been instilled in me since birth forcing me to speak through my anger. By the time I was done undressing, my father had caught up with me. Where the hell do you think you're going? I opened the door, ignoring my father and walking out onto the snow-covered balcony. The king, of course, followed me. He wasn't one to be ignored. Never had been. Anselm, I love you, but mark my words. If you don't talk to me, you'll regret it. My shifter was already leaping into my skin. But I gave it one more attempt to appease my father. I turned and garbled out the only words I could say through my teeth that were rapidly becoming those of my dragon. Dad, I can't. I need to fly. We talk. When? Back. My father nodded, an understanding settling into his eyes. He stepped back as my dragon took full control of my body. I didn't waste any more time, I dove off the side of the castle and flew toward the town, twisting my body at the last minute to soar up over the front gates. Kayla's car lay beneath me in the field, exactly where we'd left it. Memories assailed my mind. Ones I'd blocked out eight months ago. The night I'd met Kayla had been a sad one. I'd convinced myself that my mate was just over the veil, like so many kings before me. Ian and I had gotten a few whiskies into us one night and decided to go and check out the human world. It had been against the law, but we decided to actively defy our father and just go. What was the worst thing that could happen? I'd been at the tiny town over the border for only a few hours when my senses had been so overwhelmed by the people and the noise I'd wanted to go home. Instead, I'd begun to drink their strange alcohol and drink heavily. I walked the streets looking for my mate, certain that fate would let me fall over her. By the time I'd found the human bar, packed full of women, I was lost. Kayla had found me and begun a conversation. She'd been lovely from the very start. Friendly, worried about me being so far from home and not knowing anyone. Her affection had soothed my soul, and her beautiful face gave my desire wings. I hadn't known she was my fated mate. My dragon had not been awake, nor paying any attention to where I was, or who I was with. Looking back over that night, there were signs, of course, ones I'd ignored. The irrefutable attraction when I hadn't wanted any other woman in the whole place. The tingle in my skin when she'd touched me, then later when we'd been in bed together, how right the whole night had all felt. Feelings that I'd ignored and tossed aside ever since. Throughout the night, Kayla and I had shared far too many wines, and when she'd asked me if I wanted to come back to her place, I'd jumped at the chance to push away the loneliness for a few hours. What I'd assumed would be a relatively quick, cold encounter had been anything but. Kayla had kissed me like she'd been searching for me all of her life. Long, endless kisses, filled with passion and longing. The lovemaking itself had been slow, but full of desire. Each gasp and touch had been better than the last. My lack of forethought with protection could be put down to my drunken state, but really, I'd wanted to be as close to her as possible, with no barrier between us. When my brother had come for me during the night, I hadn't wanted to leave. Kayla's big, luscious body had been so warm and beautiful, part of me had wanted to stay with her forever. But Ian had talked me into going home, telling me that my fated mate wasn't here and that we had to go back to the castle empty-handed. I could still hear his words in my ear. Dad's gonna eat us for breakfast if we don't get out of here now. My God. Did I regret that choice now? How different would this year have gone if I'd brought Kayla home with me that night? Or even gone back to see her a couple of days later and explained all? I kept flying and was so lost inside my own head that I managed to fly all the way to the Black Mountains without meaning to. Eric and Marianne's castle loomed beneath me. I had a choice. 
I could turn around and fly home, deal with my parents and whatever Kayla had decided. Or I could fly down and speak to the sorceress once more. I would have to deal with my family once I turned around anyway, but since I was here, why wouldn't I ask for Marianne's help once more? Can't hurt. I began to descend, following the same pattern I had only yesterday when we'd all come to visit Jessa at her husband's castle. A servant, different to the one from yesterday, ran out onto the balcony with a white robe. I landed and let go of my dragon as quickly as possible. My head was downward spiralling into a depression I had fought hard to stay above. Thank you. I took the robe and slipped it on over my rapidly cooling body. You're welcome, Your Highness. Your sisters are in the family room talking, if you would like me to take you to them. I followed the servant out of the cold and into the warm castle. I was hoping to actually speak to Queen Marianne. Oh, I'd have to ask. Marianne marched down the hallway toward us. You're back already. I thanked the servant and fastened the robe tie around my waist. Yes. You were expecting me weren't you? The smile on the older woman's face reflected what I assumed. I was, though not quite so soon. Slipping, Queen Marianne, I teased. I don't think so. She took my arm and began walking me in the direction of the family quarters. Eric and I were talking in our suite. Come, join us. Oh, I don't want to interrupt any private time you had planned. Marianne laughed. Anselm, we've been married for thirty years. I'm sure we can cope with the occasional interruption to our schedule. I nodded my head, though I had no idea what it would be like to be in a marriage for thirty years, let alone be someone who was comfortable inviting family friends into my bedroom. We walked up to a large door, and Marianne unhooked her hand from my elbow and pushed open the door. King Eric was inside, and appeared to be trying on clothes. He was holding up shirts and jackets against his naked chest while wearing a pair of simple grey pants. Sweetheart, I... Eric turned and saw us standing in the doorway, then chuckled as he turned back to the mirror. I still have no idea what looks any good. Marianne walked over and said, This one, and this one. Then she went up on her toes and kissed her husband. You look good in everything. Eric's smug smile was that of a man who knew he was loved. He turned away from the mirror and strode over to the wardrobe, grabbing a simple thin white shirt. Hello again, Anselm, Eric said with a warm smile. I hope you'll excuse the informal garb. I didn't grow up in the palace. I prefer comfortable clothes like these when I'm able to wear them. I nodded, accepting his apology, then laughed when I realized how absurd the conversation was. I'm pretty much naked, and you're apologizing for preferring well-made cotton clothes. That seems a little odd, Uncle Eric. I often forgot that Eric had grown up poor, the son of his father's mistress, who'd been tossed out into the cold when she'd been pregnant. He hadn't expected to ascend the throne, though he wore the kingship well. Speaking of, Eric said, turning his gaze on his wife. Are you trying to tell me something, my queen? Marianne raised an eyebrow. I don't understand the question. You've brought into our bedroom an almost naked young man. I hope you're not pitching for a new lover. I'd hoped that even after all these years you were satisfied with your choice. Marianne rolled her eyes, and I tried not to swallow my tongue. Was he serious? I tried to explain. Oh, no, uh... Could you even imagine what Stavrock would say? Marianne muttered, shook her head, then walked over to her king. Then, instead of admonishing him for his question, she grabbed his face and kissed him hard. You are all I've ever wanted or needed. Now get serious. Anselm needs our help. They both turned to face me, and I immediately felt lost. I pulled the robe tighter around myself. What do you mean? How's your mate? 
Marianne asked, taking her husband's hand and walking him over to a love seat situated at the end of the grand bed. I swallowed hard, forcing my feelings of inadequacy down. I'd come here for Marianne's help in finding my mate, and so far, she hadn't steered me wrong. She's pregnant. Due to give birth any day. Any moment, I realised, taking a step toward the door. I'd made the wrong choice. I needed to go home. Home. Marianne waved her hand at my movements. You have a few more days, so save your panic and talk to us. I took a breath, attempting to calm myself. Thank you. When I didn't speak fast enough, Marianne jumped in to ask, Has Lucy convinced her to stay here to give birth? She must. I nodded. Yes, she has. Good. Marianne mused, chewing on her bottom lip. I'm not sure she would survive a birth in the human world. Your child is strong and large. It was my turn to bite my tongue. I desperately wanted to know more about my son or daughter, whichever it was. But it would be wrong to ask Marianne, then no more than Kayla. And after all, it wouldn't be long before I held the baby in my arms. I could wait. Get back to the task at hand. Kayla is angry at me for not finding her sooner, and she doesn't believe in the fated mate link. When I told her about the bond, she interpreted it to mean that I had to marry her, even if I didn't want to. Marianne turned to her husband and raised an eyebrow. You want to take this one? I turned to the king in surprise. Did he have experience in this? Eric twisted his body, so he was now completely facing me. That's not completely unusual. I had similar feelings when I met Marianne, however, everything stemmed from feeling unworthy. You must find out what is making your mate feel that way and appease her worries. That made sense, however. She seems to have some insecurities about her body shape, though I don't understand why. Especially considering I jumped into bed with her practically the moment we met. My face heated with embarrassment, but the king and queen didn't seem to worry about my words. You need to reassure her that she is desired and loved, Marianne said. Loved? Marianne smiled knowingly. Oh, you haven't spoken of love yet. I know it is early, you haven't spent a lot of time together yet, so you may need to wait until the love has grown between you. When enough time has passed. But she will need to know that you are with her because you chose it, not because you are being forced. I'm not being forced, I said, the words sounding repetitive, and yet I couldn't stop myself from uttering them. Marianne chuckled. Oh, I know that. I've been dreaming of Kayla for months and wasn't sure who she was set to marry, but I knew she was meant for this world. I was grateful to you when you came here yesterday and asked for the reading. I slept like a baby last night, knowing you had found her. I'm not sure what to do exactly, I told them. My parents have offered to take her home after the baby is born. To separate her from me. Eric's face was serious now, his forehead creased with lines. Then you must convince her to stay, Anselm. Your future happiness and that of your kingdom lies in your ability to convince Kayla that you love her. Because I can tell you, without her, you will be lost. Chapter 10 Anselm after my illuminating conversation with the King and Queen of the Black Mountains, I took to the sky once more. They were right. I had no choice but to fight for the woman who was the key to my future happiness. When I landed on the rooftop of my parents' castle, a servant rushed out with a cloak, closely followed by my father. His face was ashen. What's happened? I asked, pulling the cloak on and running for the door. Please, please let Kayla and the baby be okay. It's your mother, Dad said, swallowing hard. She had an accident. Slipped on the stairs. 
Oh, God, no! I pulled the door shut behind us, then started hurrying towards their bedroom. She isn't there. Dad stopped in the middle of the hallway. The doctor. He said she's... He didn't seem to be able to speak, and panic skittled through me. How bad was it? I grabbed my father by the arms and shook him. Dad, concentrate. Where have they got Mum? Downstairs, he said. In the guest suite. I wasn't sure why they'd put her there, but I started running. Along the hall, around the balustrade and down the spiral staircase to the main foyer. When I ran for the guest suite, I threw open the door to the hallway that led down to those bedrooms to find Kayla pacing the carpet, holding her huge belly. Are you okay? I asked, gripping her face, turning her chin left and right. There wasn't a scratch on her, yet my heart pounded and my dragon screamed inside my head. I would never have forgiven myself if you'd been hurt while I was gone. I am so sorry. I should never have left you. Kayla's eyes filled with tears. Where did you go? To Marianne, I answered honestly. She gulped audibly, the tears spilling down her cheeks. Do you love her? Love her, I repeated, then groaned. Aunt Marianne is my sister's mother-in-law. She's a sorceress. She helped me find you, and is happily married to King Eric, who's even tougher than my dad, if you can believe it. Kayla sobbed and threw herself against me, crying hard. I wrapped my arms around her and hugged her tight. Despite the tragedy of my mother's injury, my dragon began to purr with happiness, having his mate close by. Let's sit down, I told her, pulling her to the leather couch pressed against the closest wall. Tell me what has you so upset. Kayla pulled back to wipe at her eyes. It was just so horrible. The accident. I was walking behind your mum because I'm so slow. She was chatting and laughing, then she just slipped. I... I've never seen anyone hurt like that before. I pressed her head to my chest and stroked her long, soft hair. It wasn't your fault. She pushed against my chest, her gaze turning to a glare. Of course it wasn't my fault. Did someone say I pushed her? I was standing behind her, but I'd never... Oh, I didn't mean it like that. I tried to reassure her. No one said that, but you were just so upset. Kayla got to her feet, her tears dried and her red eyes flashing with anger. I'm upset because I'm pregnant and my hormones are sky high. Not that you would know that, because you haven't been there for even a minute of these nine months when I needed you. I got to my feet and reached for her, the tender moment we'd shared minutes ago disappearing into the abyss. Oh, I... Kayla pulled back, well out of reach now. I'm crying because your mother, the person who offered me a choice in staying here or not, is hurt. I'm crying because you left me again. I'm crying because you flew off to see another woman, just as I suspected. Do you love her? Maybe not. But is there another woman you do? I don't even know. I know next to nothing about you, Anselm. Nothing. I'm having your baby, and we've never even slept a whole night in the same bed. This was spiralling out of control. Kayla, I... She didn't want to hear my excuses, that was for sure. She turned on her heel and rushed down the hall and away from me once more. I watched her go, knowing I should stop her and explain everything, give her the answers to every question she had. But her anger was like a shield, and I wasn't penetrating that. Not today. Maybe not ever. The door to the guest suite opened, and the doctor I'd known my whole life stepped out. He had blood on his white apron and looked almost as ashen as my father. Dr. Tony, what's happening? I asked, rushing to meet him. Anselm, I'm glad you're back. Can I help? I asked. Does she need blood? A kidney? What can I do? My mother could have my very soul if there was a way to give it to her. 
There's nothing you can do now. The doctor sighed. What happened? I demanded. What does she need? She fell on the stairs and has managed to break her leg, fracture several ribs, and hit her head. She had massive internal bleeding as well as concussion. She needs a blood transfusion. I've done all that I can. I began unbuttoning my shirt. Take all that you need. The doctor put out his hand to stop me. She needs human blood, Anselm. Kayla, I breathed. Is that why she was so upset? The doctor nodded. Yes, but not in the way you think. She was happy to donate, but I can't in good conscience allow it. Giving blood while pregnant is very dangerous, especially so close to term. So she couldn't give my mother the blood she needed. Then what can we do? The king has sent a message to the Winter Kingdom, hoping one of King Damon's sisters-in-law can help. Otherwise, we need to cross the veil and find a donor. Okay. I nodded, digesting all the information, staying calm despite the desperation of the situation. I need to find Kayla. Will you call for me if I can do anything? Of course, your highness. The doctor bowed his head. I clapped the doctor on the shoulder and headed back to my mate. She'd locked herself in my sister's room and wouldn't come out. Kayla, please let me in so I can talk to you. No, Anselm. Go away. I turned my back on the door and pressed my spine against it. We needed to talk, but if she wouldn't listen, or perhaps she would. I slid down the door until I was sitting on the plush carpet at my feet. I smiled as I ran my hand over the surface. I'd forgotten how soft the carpet is out here. We used to roll around and play on the floor so often as children. But it's been forever since I just sat here on it. Life got serious and busy. Kayla didn't respond, but she was quiet, and I wondered if she could hear me even though she didn't want to. I kept talking, hoping she was listening and that I would say something that might break through the wall. I'm just gonna talk, okay? Feel free to throw out a question if you have any. Silence echoed back, though I could hear her breathing as though she was closer. I imagined her sitting on the carpet on the other side of the door, stroking her belly in that way she had while she was agitated. I closed my eyes and started to talk. I had a good childhood, especially considering my bloodlines. I'm my father's heir, after all. Born first, oldest son, and all that. Most other princes get their asses kicked by their dads. Gotta stay in line and all that. Not my parents. My mother is human, as you know, so super affectionate. Over the top, actually. She softens my father, makes him more human, if that's possible. Like, he's still hard. And tough. And relentless. But he's fair. He's my father first, then the king. His family comes first, and that's rare in a ruler. And I, I'm grateful. I want to be that way. With my kids. With our son or daughter. If you'll allow me. I let that sink in, and when no questions came, I continued. You asked me if I loved someone else, I said, softly, slowly. Hopefully she was listening. There is no one else, Kayla. There has never been anyone else. I chuckled. Well, of course I've been with women. It would be a lie to say anything else. But have I loved another? No. Does another hold my heart and is waiting for me to come to them while I'm in the castle with you? Hell no. I've been waiting for my fated mate my whole life. A second later I fell backward landing flat on my back on the carpet inside Kayla's room, staring up at her big pregnant belly. Ah, uh, hi. She walked over to the bed. You can come in. Keep talking. I rolled to my feet and shut the door. Thank you. Jess's room had a few large chairs, so I chose the one closest to Kayla and sat down. Did you hear everything I said? 
or do I need to repeat anything? Taylor crossed her arms over her chest. You were saying that you don't have a girlfriend or lover. I was saying that I've waited my whole life for you, Kayla. She wasn't looking at me. Instead, she stared at her hands in her lap. I took a leap of faith and stood up, then walked over to the bed. I sat down beside her and slid my hand into hers. I mean it. She held my hand but didn't look up. Then she whispered, You're just saying that. I reached for her face, cupping her cheek and drawing her face up to mine. Look at me, Kayla. She turned her face up to mine, and the vulnerability I saw in her eyes took my breath away. I wished I could say I already loved her, but Marianne was right. I needed to take the time to show her first. I want you, I said, my throat thick with emotion. I want you to stay here with me so we can get to know one another properly. Be my partner, my lover, my wife. Be whatever you want in this world. But please don't leave me. Kayla nodded softly, but I could tell that sadness still ran through her. You still don't believe I want you, do you? She shook her head. No. You're here because Marianne told you that I was your mate. Not because you felt anything for me that night, or even feel anything now. I hadn't told her about Marianne, which meant my mother probably had. There was only one way to show her how much I wanted her. You don't believe me, I asked with a smile. Then allow me to prove it. I pulled her toward me and dropped my head, pressing my mouth against her lips and losing myself in the process.